so much for joining uh, me today. You know, the challenges of urbanization is something that all of us have dealt with on a daily basis, and it's only getting worse. So I'm going to start off with you, Amitabh, and talk about uh, what are the challenges that go into creating a city? Because the DMIC, uh, the, the way it is envisaged, uh, hopes to create seven cities in the first phase, 24 by the end of it. What are the challenges that you face when you go out planning a city? Okay. Uh, I Many, you know, urbanization has actually historically lifted very vast segments of population above the poverty line. But it also leads to very unprecedented consumption of natural resources. Uh, the way cities were made earlier, they were very sprawling cities because land, gas, and water were ch very cheaply available. Mm. So there's been a change of model. And today, uh, it's very important when you plan out a new city. Uh, when you do your master planning, you learn the lessons from across the world. Sure. And the key lessons, to my mind, are that cities must grow and evolve on the back of a public transportation system. The cities must have transit-oriented development. Cities must recycle water. City, cities must reuse their waste. And more critically, because in the Indian context, because we've been a very, very reluctant urbanizer, uh, we must use technology to make a big jump forward, to leapfrog. And today, when uh, earlier, uh, when cities across America and Europe were made, they created vertical utilities. So you had sure. a power utility, a water utility. But today, digital technology enables you to create a smart, intelligent, connected city. And therefore, you can cut across these utilities, create a central command room, and manage all these utilities and provide uh, actually education, health to the people. And therefore, technology must enable public services to be provided to the people living in these cities at sure. low, uh, low points, low price points. The biggest problem Indian cities face today is that urbanization is already creeping in. It's, it's a dynamo that's been let loose. And the city infrastructure is crumbling. How do you retrofit a city which is not capable of dealing with these issues into a situation where, you know, they can do it? You know, I live in Gurgaon, and, and we're very fond of uh, saying in Gurgaon, I live in a first-rate home. I work in a first-rate office. The problem is getting from one to the other. Because when I get out of my first-rate home, and I'm on my way to the first-rate office, I'm going through a third-world infrastructure. Sure. The issue is really not that there is no money to be able to improve these things. If you look at the real estate developers, if you look at real estate individual investors, if you look at the real estate investments and the returns that are being made on those investments, they're phenomenal last 10 years, 15 years, have seen astronomical returns being made by investors. So there is clearly willingness and ability to pay for urban life, for urban development. The challenge is, and how do we capture this value that is being created, mm. right? How do we capture it through property taxes? How do we capture it through land use fee? How do we capture it through stamp duties? Or how do we capture it, as Amitabh's DMIC is trying to do, by the state becoming the aggregator of land creating better land use, and then unloading that land into the market and capturing that value. So A, how do we capture it? How do we then recycle that capital into infrastructure and the cities? And second, perhaps even more importantly, how do we do it efficiently? How do we do it through improved technologies, right? Capturing is a governance issue, tax revenues of various forms, right? When you want to do it efficiently, you've got to be able to depend on public-private partnerships. The two points that have been raised over here is one, the financing, the investment, and the other is the governance. And both combine, and, you know, they go hand in hand. But, Sumitha, let me get you in here. You know, the, the problem with the kind of urbanization that we've seen in existing cities is that the rural poverty has translated into urban squalor. And you have cities which are not capable of doing it. Yeah, I think the healthcare issues in the urban sector, to some extent, are related to what we just discussed. So if you've got garbage piling up in Bangalore, like you have now, and then you have mosquitoes and malaria and dengue, but you're quarantining people from Africa because of yellow fever, you've got already you know, a huge healthcare issue which is related to urban problems. Sure. Then sanitation and its problems. You add to that things like the growing cities, traffic, road rage, taking four hours to get home, back and forth, concrete jungles, no lung spaces, You've got issues of sedentary lifestyles, blood pressure rising, early strokes, early diabetes. 
So you've got all these challenges of urban living, stress, hypertension, massive killer now in India, heart disease. So these are kind of the, the new age things that we didn't have that we're seeing in the cities of today. Add that on to, okay, we need healthcare infrastructure, you need healthcare delivery. So you need doctors, you need nurses, you need technicians, you need hospitals, you need healthcare centers. Real estate prices are rising. It's very hard for people to set up healthcare infrastructure unless they have deep pockets, which is why you're seeing the deep pockets and health cities and larger and larger health cities. So a lot of the healthcare activity is being concentrated really in hospitals. Mm. So primary healthcare, which is what we fundamentally need, because 90% of your problems, you don't need to go to a hospital. You need a good general physician. You need uh, a good nurse who will you know, check your BP. But there's no money in it. So there's no primary healthcare development. Real estate's too expensive to spend it on primary healthcare. Then you talk about, OK, even for super specialty or primary healthcare, you need the docs. India has a shortage. Not that we don't train enough. We've, we've traditionally had immigration, not just of doctors, of nurses, of ECG technicians. So the Planning Commission of India estimates we have a shortage of 10 lakh nurses. We have a shortage of 6 lakh doctors. Mm. So we're, we're training, yes, but we could train faster. We could train better. Um, we could make sure we retain them. Now, whenever you have a shortage, and that's what's happening in the medical field, you have a shortage of super specialists. <coughs> sure. so prices go up. The other thing we seem to have uh, imported from, uh, from the rural landscape is the poverty. And often, you know, despite the talk of financial inclusion, that's the end that doesn't get covered, the urban poor. And the urban poor are perhaps poorer and more marginalized than the rural poor. How, how does the banking system tackle that kind of situation? Uh, excellent question, Mini. I think there are two parts to this. The first is clearly getting the people into uh, the financially included part. And that's where technology and banking are interfacing with each other to bring those in at very low cost points, something which is always on, something which is safe and secure and easy to use, intuitive for people, because this is the first time many of these will enter formal uh, financial services access. And they should know how to use this, because the costs of not doing it right, political, social, and economic, are just too much for it to fail. So that's the first important point. The second thing I would want to say is both uh, Pradeep uh, and Sunita raised this point. Financial services and technology are, again, infrastructural enablers. And that despite whether there are old cities or there are new cities that are getting made, they can, from current level, make things far more efficient. She spoke about there being no money in uh, the healthcare services to be provided the way it is. We can make it happen uh, at a very low cost point <coughs> and in different models, whether you go to a hospital or don't go to a hospital. Sure. And so the key thing is, how do you make it happen in an interface with technology? Mobile is being talked about as the panacea for that, but is <coughs> it really is. Why can't I, as an individual, go and access any product or service anywhere I want to with just myself. I don't have to carry any device. I don't have to carry a card. I don't have to carry a mobile. I have my thumbprints. I have my eyes. And so biometric recognition and I pay because sure. I am unique. And so I'm authenticating that payment and it links with my account which is biometrically enabled and the payment gets done. So that is the world that we should move to because this is intuitive. Everyone knows how to use their uh, fingers and their eyes. And I think that is where um, our industry has to move along with uh, the technology partners uh, to get people to access financial services.